Hello and welcome to this worship service coming to you from Clevedon Family Church in uh, North Somerset. We're on the, the banks of the uh, beautiful Bristol Channel here in North Somerset, England uh, on this Lord's Day morning. Uh, welcome to you if you are part of our church family or if you are a virtual visitor to us. Uh, you are all very welcome. This is now the fifth Sunday that we haven't been able to physically be together due to the current public health restrictions. So once again, there's only me and Sam, our technical support here in the church building. Uh, but wherever you are, and where, whether you are alone or with family, you are not alone. God is with us as we meet in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are together in spirit. Uh, normally we would uh, do uh, announcements uh, of activities and of course uh, nothing is able to, to happen at the moment except in a virtual way and you, you will know if you're involved in one of those uh, virtual meetings. Uh, we have uh, a birthday. I, I'm only aware of one birthday this week and that's a, a shout out to, to Lily. Now we are sure that there, there has been someone else. Uh, so if it was your birthday this week and uh, I haven't uh, mentioned you, uh, please uh, accept uh, our good wishes and congratulations on your birthday. So, and happy birthday again to Lily. Uh, it might be just a moment to, to mention that we do have a, a help line available if you are in the Clevedon area and you, uh, in these times of difficult times of restriction, if you are needing anything, you can get in touch with us by email uh, and uh, details are on our website, I think, or on our Facebook page at least, but you can certainly email us on at uh, help at Clevedon Family Church, or one word, uh, dot org. And you're very welcome to do that if you are in our area. Now, we're going to worship the Lord this morning uh, in the way that we're becoming accustomed to now. <laughs> Over the last few weeks, we've got contributions from, from different people. And uh, we're going to ask God's blessing on our time together. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, loving God, uh, we commit this special time into your hands. Ask for your Holy Spirit to work among us. And we ask uh, you to, to bless us as we, as we draw near to you, that according to your promise, you will draw near to us. Amen. Now uh, we're going to sing a great hymn of the faith. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. And, and Luke, Zach and Maisie are going to lead us. How Great Thou Art.
his son and spare him, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly buried, he bled and died to take. to have you with us this morning and uh, we're going to do church. I know you're not in church this morning, are you? Because I can look around and I can't see you. But we are doing church. We're doing church in our own homes. And uh, there's a reason we can do that, boys and girls. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, But first, uh, let's think about different places where people might live. Okay, I've got uh, some pictures for you now that come up on the screen. And uh, they're just different places uh, where people might live. Have a look at these. Uh, Well, kids, I hope you enjoyed uh, those uh, pictures of people's homes. Maybe you uh, recognize some. Some of them are very famous. Uh, And uh, so they're all places, aren't they, that people might live, if you count uh, SpongeBob as a person like I do, because, of course, he lives in a pineapple under the sea. So he's unusual as a person. Uh, But the reason I was going to tell you, wasn't I, why we can do church in our own home. And that's because of something that Jesus said uh, when he was raised from the dead. After his resurrection on Easter Day, some little time later, he met with his disciples on top of a mountain. 
And this is what he told them. He told them, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that means that wherever we are and uh, wherever we uh, happen to be, Jesus is there with us because that's what he promised. He said, I, will, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's why we can do church this morning and know wherever we are that Jesus is with us. Now we've got a song to teach you now, uh, and it's a fun song. It's got lots of actions. I don't know if you've know, know this before, uh, but it's one of my favorites. And it's called, I May Live in a Great Big City. And the, uh, we'll go through it slow, okay? It goes, uh, I may live in a great big city. I may live in a village small. I may live in a tiny house. I may live in a tower tall. I may live in the countryside, that's the hills. I may live by the sea, that's the waves. And then there's a trick, okay? Because we count one, we count two, three, four, and then we all shout, but, as loud as we can. See if you can wake your neighbors up. You count, but, wherever I live, I know that Jesus always lives with me. And then again, but, wherever I live, I know that Jesus lives with me. So we'll try that, do that again before I, I start playing the music. Okay, I may live in a great big city, I may live in a village small. I may live in a tiny house. I may live in a tower tall. I may live in the countryside. I may live by the sea. <gasps> but wherever I live, I know that Jesus always lives with me. But wherever I live, I know that Jesus lives with me. Okay, we'll try it to... See if you can sing along. I think the words are going to go up. And you can certainly, definitely do the actions, and definitely do the big, massive but. I may live in a great big city. I may live in a village small. I may live in a tiny house. I may live in a tower tall. I may live by the countryside. I may live by the sea. But wherever I live, I know that Jesus always lives Wherever I live, I know that Jesus lives with me. I may live in a great big city. I may live in a village small. I may live in a tiny house. I may live in a tower tall. I may live in the countryside. I may live by the sea. But wherever I live, I know that Jesus always lives with me. But wherever I live, I know that Jesus lives with me. Thank you, boys and girls. Thank you for joining in. It's lovely to have you with us. And God bless you. Now, uh, we're going to have a time of worship now. Uh, following the worship, uh, we will have the Bible reading. And uh, that is going to be from John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. John chapter 20, 24 to 31. But now, uh, let us worship the Lord. It's the son of the redeemed, rising from the African day. It's the song of the forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers, filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. 
to be reading from John 20 verses 24 to 31. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. The purpose of John's Gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This week we're looking at the subject of doubt. You might think this is a strange subject to be tackling so soon after Easter. After all, it was only a week ago that we were singing, No more we doubt the glorious Prince of Life. But I think it's appropriate to look at the issue of doubt in the Christian life on this Sunday, because that's exactly where the Bible takes us. The events of our reading occur just one week after the resurrection. And it's not the only time that doubt is mentioned in connection with the resurrection. In Matthew 28, when the, the risen Jesus 
meets his disciples on the mountain in Galilee and gives them what we know as the Great Commission. We read this, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So the first thing to say is that God always appears to leave room for doubt. The pastor and writer R.T. Kendall says, God always does things in such a way that we can either accept or reject them. And the reason God acts this way is surely to leave room for faith. Faith is our proper response to God in view of who he is and what he has done for us. Faith is the way we access salvation because it's the way we say to God, I was wrong and you were right. Without faith, we are still in a position of rebellion against God. That's why Hebrews 11 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it's why the 16th century reformers stood so firmly on the, the truth that they found in Ephesians 2 and elsewhere. We are saved by grace through faith. In other words, your faith doesn't save you. What saves you is the love of God and the Father, God the Father in sending his Son to die for you and the obedience of God the Son, Jesus in taking your punishment on the cross. It's grace because you didn't deserve it. We are saved entirely by the grace of God. He loved us so much that even though we didn't deserve it, he made a way for us to be forgiven and be with him forever. But the way we access that undeserved grace of God is through faith, by faith in Jesus, believing in who Jesus is and in what he has done for us, and proving the reality of our faith by giving our lives to him. That's the way we respond to the grace of God and access that grace in salvation. And as I said, faith is essentially at saying, God, I'm sorry for being your enemy. I accept that I was wrong and you were right. And, and from now on, I'm going to live your way and not mine. And I just say that, uh, you know, it's early in the message for a, for a call, an altar call, but, but if you haven't done that, can I just respectfully say to you, you do need to. You do need to do that. And you can do that. You can do that even today. To get before God and say that kind of form of words and mean them. Faith in Jesus Christ is crucially important to our eternal destiny, which makes the issue of doubt a bit of a, a thorny one, a pressing one even, because doubt is the opposite of faith, isn't it? Surely we can't have faith and have doubt at the same time. The Bible is clear that although doubt works against faith, and so it's an undesirable thing, uh, it's certainly not a deal breaker where faith is concerned. Faith can exist alongside doubt in the experience of a true believer, a true follower of Jesus. In fact, I wouldn't say that it was essential, but I would suggest that it was normative for faith and doubt to coexist. Many of us would agree with the man we encounter in Mark 9 who said to Jesus, Lord, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. So examining doubt in the life of of a believer. We should say that not all Christians uh, are troubled to an equal degree by doubt. This comes partly, I think, down to temperament. In our reading, we met the disciple called Thomas, and because of what he says and does in our reading, his name has gone into popular culture, isn't it? Popular usage. You know, we might say about someone, well, he's a doubting Thomas. This is slightly unfair to Thomas, because as we'll see, as we see, uh, he became believing Thomas by the end of his encounter with Jesus. Thomas is an interesting person among the disciples. We don't know uh, a lot about him, but what we do read in the Gospels gives us a pretty good insight into his character. Apart from appearing in lists of disciples, Thomas is only mentioned three times in, in the Bible, three Bible passages, all in John's Gospel, and they have something of a common thread about them. First in John 11, Jesus' disciples are trying to persuade him that it will be too dangerous for him to go to Judea to heal his friend Lazarus. And Thomas ends the discussion by saying, uh, let us also go, that we may die with him, die with Jesus. So here's something about the doubting Thomas. He's not lacking in courage, and he's not lacking in commitment. 
He's just not expecting a good outcome. Apart from today's reading, we only hear Thomas's voice one more time. That's in John 14 when Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death. And he uses the words we often hear at funerals. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And then he goes on, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And it's then that Thomas pipes up. And in my mind, Thomas is almost irritated by what Jesus has said. I wonder if, as a believer, you've had the experience of being irritated with Jesus. You've had some tragedy or some disappointment in your life, and you read the Bible thinking, well, it's all very well for Jesus to say those things. I need more than words. I need reality. And this is Thomas. You know, Lord, he says, he's still calling him Lord. He is a believer. He's a follower of Jesus. Lord, uh, we don't know where we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? I think we're we're building up a picture of Thomas and the way he sees life. I suggest that Thomas is basically a pessimist. You know, if if Simon Pigger, Peter is Tigger, then uh, kind of bouncing around saying the first thing that comes into his head, then Thomas is Eeyore. You know, for Thomas, if something seems too good to be true. It probably is. You know, where some people see an opportunity, Thomas sees a potential disaster. And some of us are like that. I'm more than a little bit like that myself. I I think that natural pessimists are more likely to be troubled by doubt than natural optimists. It's just the way we are. Because what does the gospel mean? The gospel means good news. The gospel of Jesus is really, really good news. Good news that for a pessimist, it can look too good to be true. So those of us who are natural pessimists are, I suggest, more likely to be skeptical about the gospel. We are likely, like, Jesus, like Thomas, to have more doubts about it. Because that's how Thomas reacts to the news that Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, that's too good to be true. So he doesn't believe the other disciples when he, they tell him, uh, we have seen the Lord. No, no. Says Thomas, I'm having none of that. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. The other thing our reading shows is that for a believer in Christ, doubt doesn't need to be a permanent fixture. Thomas, by the end of our reading, he encounters the risen Jesus and his doubts are gone in a moment. He becomes the first disciple to actually say what for a Jew would have been unthinkable under any other circumstance. He calls Jesus God. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And so although doubt may be normative for a follower of Jesus, it's not inevitable that it remains a defining feature of their spiritual life. Doubt can be dealt with. And this morning I propose just briefly to identify three kinds of doubt and suggest uh, ways that we can, we can deal with them. Firstly, the doubts that arrive because of our minds, like intellectual doubts, you may say. And these doubts derive mainly from the fact that, as Colossians 1 puts it, God is invisible to us. By contrast, the natural world impacts powerfully on all our senses. It's, as we say, in our faces. And this is especially true in the, what we call the first world, the, world, uh, the part of the world we live in, uh, where scientific rationalism has been the dominant thought form for 300 years. Although many scientists are Christian believers, the dominant idea given to us by science is that the natural world is all that there is. And what can't be explained by science is just something that science hasn't explained yet but one day will. There is no room for God. And although many politicians are Christian believers, politics is generally outworked as though God wasn't there. Same for entertainment and the media. The upshot is that faith in God has long ceased to be a matter of common sense for us as it might have been in the Middle Ages and before. In order to believe in God, we have to actively go against what is widely considered to be common sense. How do we do that? 
I think one way is to remember that common sense, uh, while it is a useful thing, isn't quite all it's cracked up to be. Now, common sense is a very useful thing. I remember uh, when I moved into a, a rented flat, it was the first time in my life that I actually had to cook for myself. And I wondered on that first evening, I thought, oh, what would I really like for, for tea? I thought I'd have a pizza. I went to the, the corner shop, I bought a pizza, I came home and I, I put it in the oven. And it was only when I took the pizza out of the oven that I realized that you're meant to take it off the polystyrene plate that it comes on. Common sense uh, would have done me very well on that occasion, but I lacked it. Common sense is a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, but, as I say, is it all it's cracked up to be? Einstein, arguably the greatest brain of the 20th century, had very little time for common sense. He called it the collection of prejudices acquired by the age of 18. And Einstein's groundbreaking theory of relativity was initially widely rejected on the grounds that it defied common sense. Only later, it was proved to be true. So belief in God may require us to push back against what we feel is common sense. But here's the thing. It doesn't require us to put our faculties of reason into cold storage. There are many valid reasons why belief in God is perfectly reasonable. There's the fine-tuning of the universe, how the, the more we know about the universe, the more intricate and finely balanced we discover it to be. So that even many uh, atheist scientists now say that although they don't believe the universe was created, it certainly looks as if it was. And there's the mystery of human consciousness how I know I'm me and not you. Why my emotions are stirred by a piece of music or a beautiful sunset. You know, a scientist can tell me uh, all about the frequency of the notes going together in a piece of music or why the sunset comes to be that color. But he hasn't a clue about why do I feel like I do when I encounter that piece of music, when I see that sunset. And there are many other things that we could, we could do, we could set against our intellectual doubts about God. And the important thing with these intellectual doubts is, is don't let them ride roughshod over you, masquerading as common sense. As someone has said, always put your doubts under as much scrutiny as you do your faith. Second kind of doubt is the doubt that arises because of our will. C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, as well as uh, lots of more serious theology books, uh, described himself before he became a Christian like this. I didn't only not believe in God, I didn't want there to be a God. And that's an aspect of human nature that the Bible affirms. John 3, 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Whether you're a believer this morning or you are someone yet to be persuaded of the truth of the gospel, there is one certain thing that I can tell you about your life. You commit sin. You think, say, or do things you shouldn't. It's quite likely that you have a habitual sin, something you keep on doing. You know, maybe it's to do with lust. Maybe it's to do with pride. Maybe uh, you de-stress by taking your anger out on on you know innocent people around you. Maybe you like possessions too much when there's a world of hunger and need out there. If, a, if you're a believer, there's one thing you know about sin, and that is that God hates it. But we sin because we get something we need from it, whether it's uh, you know viewing things on the internet that we shouldn't or harboring unkind and judgmental thoughts about other people. We do it because either because we enjoy it or because it fulfills some felt need in our lives. God hates it, but we want to do it. And so our minds play a clever trick. They get God out of the way by introducing a doubt. Maybe God doesn't mind what I do. Maybe God's not there at all. 
And after we've committed the sin and the doubts have served their purpose, then our minds work to bring us back to a faith position. But the damage has been done. We almost inevitably lose some ground spiritually. If faith is a journey with Jesus, then every time we let our minds uh, do that trick of introducing doubt so that we can sin, we kind of take a step backwards. You know, and then we have to recover from it. And so, uh, like we're doing a, a two steps forward, one step back. And the remedy for this uh, kind of doubt is twofold, isn't it? First, we do our best to avoid sin. Because it does have a damaging effect on our faith. We remember that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God's power at work in us can do more than we can ask or imagine. We can be purified. We can become more like Jesus. And we remember that it's worth it. Because when we deny ourselves what God says is wrong, he is able to satisfy the hunger that we were trying to deal with when we sin in a far, far more complete way. The other way we, way we deal with those doubts is when we do sin, we don't stay away from God. We run to him. We ask him to forgive us. Uh, I mean, it is very wonderful. The Christian gospel is so very wonderful. God, God sees everything we do. I mean, that's not so very wonderful for some of us, but, but even the most worst shameful things, and he still loves us. So 1 John 2 says, uh, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And a few verses earlier, he's written, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. For some of us, many of our doubts would disappear if we got a handle on our habitual sins. But the wonderful bottom line is that if we're in Christ, sin does not separate us from God, from the love of God, and neither does it alter the relationship we have with him as his precious and dearly loved children. And the third kind of doubt, uh, the last one, doubts that arise because of our emotions. You know, sometimes things come into our lives that cause us to be disappointed. Sometimes things come into our lives that cause us to experience pain, to suffer. And at those times, we might find ourselves asking the old, age-old question, if there is an all-powerful and an all-loving God, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to someone I love? Why uh, do these things happen in the world every day? Is God really there? You know, this is the problem, isn't it, of human suffering. Suffering is a subject that requires at least a sermon all of its own. I mean, books and books and books have been written on, from a Christian perspective on, on the issue of suffering. You know, some of my uh, recent sermons have gone into it further than we can today. Today we just need to say that the doubts that arise from our, from our emotions due to suffering, they are not insurmountable. There are arguments we can bring to bear against them if we want to. Maybe we could remember that as well as knowing and caring for us as individuals, God sees a very big picture. You know, it's not true that the existence of suffering means that God can't be both all-loving and all-powerful. What it means is that God has access to information that we don't. You know, that's very hard to, to, to take when we're in the midst of suffering. It's not a, a, an explanation, but it's logically sound. God sees a bigger picture than we do. And sometimes this causes him to allow things to happen to us that he would prefer if all things were equal that didn't happen to us. Furthermore, because God is all-powerful, he is able to make good on the statement we find in inspired scripture, Romans 8.1. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Maybe we would do also well to remember what Jesus promised and what he didn't promise. 
Jesus never promised us an easy life without disappointment or suffering. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said that to follow him would mean denying ourselves and taking up a cross. In fact, Jesus said that in addition to the disappointment and suffering that is normative in this life, his followers could expect extra hardship. But he said, following me is the way to life in all fullness. Now we get just a taste of this fullness in this life uh, when we trust Jesus to be true to the words I used in my children's talk. Oh, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Followers of Jesus know the presence of Jesus with them in all times, good and bad. Sometimes they delight in his presence. Sometimes they only know it by faith. In the worst of times, uh, they cling to Jesus for comfort and strength to go on but he is always there for them. But uh, that's not all. I remember, I have, I have two boys, they've just grow, grown up now, uh, but I remember uh, how it is where you, you put a plate of food uh, in front of a teenage lad, and uh, they, they eat it all, and then they say, well, that was very nice, thanks, Dad. Uh, th that was presumably the starter. Now, uh, what's for the main course? And that, that's kind of how the, the Christian life works. This this life, uh, the Bible makes clear, is a starter. Yeah, we fix our eyes on what is yet to come. And then the promise is that one day, uh, the suffering inherent in this life will be over, and those who have trusted in Jesus, who have said to him, my Lord and my God, will enter the new life that he entered, free from restriction, free from disappointment, free from suffering. Just as COVID-19 will one day be a thing of the past, so will all suffering for those who enter eternity with Jesus. So to sum up, doubt is a troublesome thing for believers in Jesus. It can rob us of our sense of closeness to him. In extreme forms, it can cause great anguish of soul. But doubt doesn't need to go unchallenged. We have arguments we can use against the doubts that arrive through our minds, through our wills, and through our emotions. Thomas's doubts disappeared in an instant when he encountered the risen Jesus for himself. And we can have an equivalent encounter with Jesus today. As Mervyn said last week, the Holy Spirit comes to make Jesus present in the world today. Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. And that was for us, those who believe without seeing Jesus with our eyes. It is possible today to have an encounter with the risen Jesus through the Bible and the Holy Spirit that is just as effective and life-changing as the encounter Thomas had. That being the case, can I pray for us now? We pray. Father, I ask you to send the Spirit to make the risen Jesus as real to us as he was to Thomas. I pray for those who have yet to meet Jesus, have yet to be persuaded that he is your Son and the way to eternal life. I pray that you will open their eyes to the reality that the gospel of Jesus is reasonable, truthful, and the most wonderful demonstration of your love for them. Bring them from unbelief to saving faith, from darkness to light, from death to life, for your Son's sake. And I pray also for believers who are struggling with doubt at this time whether caused by intellectual difficulties and ongoing wish to sin, or due to the, the circumstances that are causing them disappointment or pain. According to your promise, be present with them and to them, I pray. Remind them of the reasons they have.
for the hope that you put in them. Strengthen them by the Holy Spirit to return to a place of faith and trust in you and restore to them the joy of their salvation. And now we pray uh, for the world and the situation uh, that is ongoing in it. Father, we call out to you in these difficult times when uh, there's so much uh, suffering and anxiety and disruption and restriction. Oh, we pray for an end to this uh, virus. We will rid it from the earth. That you will help all, all those who are, who are working, the scientists and the uh, experts, to contain this thing. And we pray for those who are on the front line of care, doctors and nurses and support staff and carers in the community and, and in uh, re residential homes, for the other emergency services, for shop workers and delivery drivers and, and all those who are uh, working together Lord, to get us uh, through this time. Pray for our politicians that they will make wise choices. And we pray for those who are currently sick. Lord, that you will bring healing. That you will make them well. And that you will give uh, comfort and peace to their relatives as they wait. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. That you will comfort them and draw near to them and strengthen them and bless them. Lord, we uh, know that you are good all the time. We know that you have a plan and a purpose. And we invite you Lord, to work that good purpose out and bring this thing to an end. In Jesus' name, Amen. Why don't we join together in the, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to have our closing uh, song, and it's an old one done in, a, in a, a more modern way. We're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. And uh, before that, we just want to say thank you to Sam once again for doing our technical uh, stuff, and uh, we're so blessed to have him to do that. And also our musicians, uh, Luke, Zach, and Maisie, for, for leading us in worship. Uh, we thank also Natalie uh, for reading for us. Let's sing together.
Thank you for joining us today for our worship. And now a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.